out there. Uh, welcome to our third Design Z Day talk. Uh, the topic is why design ops matters. Uh, both of our presenters are from EPAM's experience consulting and design practice with extensive experience in building design teams and design culture, as well as producing design at scale. Uh, so we have Jay Dantine from EPAM's Netherlands office and Andy O'Farrell from the UK office. So before we get started, I just want to remind everyone to open up your Q&A chat and be sure to post your questions to vote on your favorites. Um, the speakers will choose the most pop their favorite question at the end to win a prize for the bals one year balsamic subscription. So be sure not to post as anonymous. OK, take us away, Jay and Andy. OK, thank you very much for uh, that introduction. OK, so today's plan is we want to do a quick intro into what design ops is and um, we want to put that into a little bit of context and look at the evolution of design and, and its current state. Um, we want to take a look at some of the key challenges facing large companies and EPAM and then, you know, have a have a discussion and have a look at how design ops can help. Um, I would also like to point out that later on today, Farid will be doing a session at 12.20. He'll be looking more into the detail of workflows and tools and, and things like that. So re I, I really recommend that you catch that. And then there's a workshop at uh, three o'clock. Uh, uh, this afternoon. So as you can see, uh, design ops is pretty much uh, 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 a popular topic at the moment. So let's uh, let's talk. Let, let's introduce this topic. So design has you know evolved and matured as a practice and competency from the early days when um, it was prime primarily for those of us that were there uh, 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 an afterthought to make stuff pretty and um, right through to the realization that good design is good for business. Um, I've always felt that design has had a sustainability challenge within large organizations. And I'm reminded uh, of my time of when I worked at Deutsche Telekom, uh, the, the, the big telecommunications company. I was there for uh, 14 years. And in 2007, 2008, when Apple launched the iPhone and then Android, um, came out with their new uh, operating system, the telco world was turned upside down. Its business model uh, came under attack and it began to lose uh, market share. And <clears throat> Deutsche Telekom at that time um, embarked on a digital transformation program. And part of that program was to build up its design competency as it saw uh, that design um, was was an um, it began to realize that design was an important uh, part of the product story. Um, what I what I remember from that time is that we built up a design team from nine people to 130 people in five years, and basically we we dragged uh, the design uh, into into the organization. We built it up as a, a proper department, um, as a proper competency. And one of the things that we had then, which which really was design ops, we at the time we called it design management, but it helped us really um, embed design into the structures of the of the company, from a governance perspective, from a budget perspective, from a process perspective. And without that, we wouldn't have been able to sustain the or the, the 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 design department. Um, around that time, and and even since then, we've seen a lot of investment in design uh, departments within in, in big companies. And sometimes they only last two two years less, and they're gone. I know this has happened in Tesco's in the UK. It's happened in Barclays. They've invested a lot of money. They've had a big expectation, and for some reason, they've disappeared, um, or they've they've been reduced massively in scope. And I think the reason for that is that they didn't have a really competent design operations um, set up to really uh, take design into the organization. Um, so, you know, the value of design is understood and proven. Um, I think any of us that have been around long enough have gone through all those 
uh, arguments uh, with management and within companies trying to prove the value of design. Um, and today we designers find themselves involved in both strategic and design related activities as well as trying to cope with the relentless uh, pace of change business demands and the complexities of working in large organizations. So you might say design is maturing and um, it's definitely got its place at the top table. It's 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 recognized and understood. Its value is understood. And um, though it's constantly evolving, uh, design ops is becoming a key su success factor in running quality driven, integrated and efficient design organizations. So uh, OK, hold on. Yeah. Um, what is design ops? Over to you, Jay. Sure, thanks. So um, so what you see here is, is the definition that, that we at EPAM have started to put together. Um, there are a lot of definitions out there, and, and um, I think that's kind of the interesting thing about this topic as it continues to evolve. Everyone sort of sees it differently and everyone's sort of trying to get wrap their heads around um, exactly what it is and, and, and what it means to, to individual organizations. Um, but the way we've been kind of uh, this is sort of the, the the working definition that we have at the moment with what we've been what we've been doing, and that's um, seeing design ops as as focus on operations inside and outside of design teams, um, looking at ways to uh, increase speed, efficiency, quality, um, and really to um, to improve uh, and amplify design's uh, value and impact at scale. Uh, yep. So areas covered by design ops again you know we're saying here that companies tend to pick and, and and mix and match to fit their circumstances obviously this is a, again a really broad topic and there's a lot involved um, but some examples of the types of things that that um, you know we see fitting into this uh, fall into categories like organization and governance um, getting the work done uh, and then how that work creates impact and, and how it's measured and looked at over time so everything on the on the left side from uh, you know things like culture uh, environment the, the composition of teams um, you know how those teams kind of uh, are assembled and and um, and uh, work uh, from team to team and, and kind of collaborate uh, um, from an intra team perspective, let's say, um, to then how those how those teams work uh, internally to their their own projects and, and and the things that they do and then how we measure that over time. If you want to jump to the next one, yeah. So who who actually does this? Um, the the easy answer is it depends. Um, and it depends really largely on things like the level of organization maturity, the size of the design team, the type of the business, the, these kinds of things. Um, in this talk, we're going to focus, I would say, much more on um, design teams of larger scale, uh, simply because that's um, uh, partially where we see this um, kind of uh, the, the largest necessity for this, but also, um, you know, EPAM is a large organization, and this is this is the type of thing that we're building for ourselves. Um, but uh, also looking at the types of people that might actually be involved in this. It doesn't necessarily have to be designers, right? Um, it can definitely be experienced design professionals, people who have a background of design, um, who kind of uh, are interested in, in more of the uh, interworkings of a design team and an organization and how that works with the larger business. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that, that type of person. Some designers aren't interested in that, right? And it can also be, um, you know, people who have uh, those skill sets from other, other areas like digital producers, pro uh, project managers, program managers, that kind of thing. Um, and this is just a small snapshot of the many different groups that are out there kind of doing this stuff. It's, it's obviously, I think it, most designers that would be uh, attending this, this call should probably be aware of the term design ops and, and know that it's, it's, it's no new topic. It's, it's been around for a while. And a lot of the things that we mentioned two slides ago are things that people have probably been doing for years. But, but really what we're trying to show here is that this is the practice of, uh, or, the, or the effort to pull all this together in a more uh, cohesive sense and try to, try to make better sense of it and make it all work together. So how did we get to this point? I think. Uh, Andy. Yeah. So so you know at least we forget. And for I don't know what the age composition of the audience here is, but I can tell you this is one of the first browsers I used. Um, and that's a, that thing on the right for anybody that doesn't know is called a modem. Uh, that one there is a 56k. My first modem was 14k. So this is what we were working with at the very beginning of our of our journey. So if we look at a snapshot of that across time and um, at the beginning from 1994 onwards up to 2000, I would say you could say that it was technology led innovation and um, there was a lot of experimentation going on. There was a bit of a technology gold rush. There was a lot of hype around the Internet about what it was going to deliver, the money that could be made, 
um, the, the rewards for, for early starters and all that good stuff. But from a design perspective, we were battling with the, with the legacy from, from print and advertising. Um, we had very little control as designers over, over layout. We had practically no tools. Um, at the beginning, there wasn't really such a thing as an interaction designer or a service designer. Those things didn't really exist. Um, I remember in those bad old days, the tool we used was Visio. I still have nightmares about it. But, you know, that, that was our world then. Uh, we were very much second fiddle to technology. Um, design was brought in at that point just to, to make things pretty. Um, and we were very constrained by the by the technology. Then we move into 2000 and beyond. Of course, we had the big dot com bust. Um, from a business perspective, then things began to get more realistic. Um, expectations were that companies would begin and should have uh, proper business models. Um, what what we all so Adam was uh, Web 2.0, and that's when it began to get more interesting from a design perspective because we we began to get more control, more there was more interaction with the user, there was asynchronous uh, data flows, um, and also within the most importantly within the universities and uh, educational um, establishments, there was a lot of design curriculums beginning to to. To, to come into being. So we began to mature as a practice uh, from, from that pr pr perspective. And I think that one of the big inflection, inflection points for me was in 2007, 2008, when Apple launched the iPhone, because it was, they really brought, they, they brought a couple of things home. One was they brought home the value of design. They brought home the value of thinking end to end, and they began to introduce um, experience ecosystems. and what what you have then is this focus and this shift to experience. Um, uh, moving forwards into 2012 and beyond, because of this understanding of, of design and the value of design, you had the rise of agency acquisitions. So a lot of the big uh, um, consultancies began to acquire agencies because they they saw that the, the design was an integral part of the, 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 the product story. Um, also, uh, what we've had in the last few years is there's been a lot more um, tools available to designers, um, and, and this is, a, you know, this reflects the, the the importance of of design in the in in the workflow and delivering great great experiences. And most importantly of all, business performance began to really matter. Google, Amazon, Apple, all the big players, Facebook began to and come out of their investment periods into profit profitability. And um, because this, the, the value of design was understood, also the expectation of, on, on design has risen. Um, we design today is involved from conception right through to delivery. Um, it's an integral part of product, um, uh, product uh, delivery and product success. So um, to, to, to achieve that, we need one, the tools, and we need the processes to be able to, to, to do that. And, and as, as Jay said, in a, in a more holistic and cohesive, cohesive manner. Yeah, so I think, like Andy mentioned on the last, on the last page there, the, the, the value, the perceived value of design has, has increased um, massively in, in recent years. And this is just to kind of show, um, when you look at, at companies of scale that are, um, uh, oftentimes, our, our competitors, for example, the, the, these everyone's kind of buying this stuff up and everyone's seeing the, the value here. So this is just since 2013, uh, the number of acquisitions just from a, a snapshot of uh, different types of um, uh, product and service companies. Um, if you go to the next one, Andy. And just to show that EPM is really no different. Um, I, I think anyone inside of EPM knows that, that some of the acquisitions that we've had, um, and just to point out a few. So these, this is kind of where our own experience has come in, in observing this because we've got all these different groups coming together um, the scale is happening globally for us, lots of different um, organizations, and then also organic growth inside of, uh, of an organization like ours. We, we've seen lots of um, uh, expansive growth both from inside and, and through acquisition. Uh, that brings in lots of different types of cultures, uh, ways of working, all this kind of stuff, right? So the whole um, 
scale challenge becomes uh, really compounded, uh, um, and, and that's that's especially apparent when it comes to something like design. Uh, and, and just just really quickly to point out that the the investments in design uh, that Andy was kind of talking about a couple slides ago are, are definitely paying off. And here's just two examples. Um, if you look uh, below uh, or on the right side, you see the the design value index from the Design Management Institute, which uh, you know plots. Um, uh, design centric companies against the s p 500 and you, you obviously see a return uh, on investment there and then to the right um, mckinsey's own design index uh, scoring and, and how that outperforms in terms of revenue and returns to stakeholders so um, you know investments have been made and investments are paying off um, and, that, and that's really apparent okay so I, I think what we've what we've tried to show is that design has found its place at the top table. The value of design is is understood. You know, good design is good for business. So, I what, what I'd like to do now is look at some of the challenges that we face in a in a broader macro sense, and just to put into context um, the expectation on design as a competency as well. Um, first thing I'd like to say is that design ops challenges applies. Uh, what we're talking about here applies uh, to EPAM as well as our clients. Um, I think we should uh, hold that in, in in mind as we as we go along. So the reality today is that there's a, 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 a there's an ever increasing complexity of touch points. Um, it's not just about single interfaces anymore. It's about ecosystems. It's about experience across these ecosystems. And these 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 um, these ecosystems are becoming more complex. They're becoming more integrated. The expectation from uh, from users is 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 relentless. Uh, they want things to work. They want them to work in different contexts. They want them to work in different channels and different devices. Um, and that, of course, um, has its own design challenges. So we have this massive increase. Uh, in complexity of, of, of touch points. Then we have just the, the reinvention of just about anything and obsessive customer centricity. So, you know, the last 10 years have, have really shown nearly every industry has been impacted by by reinventing some service of, or, or, or another. And you only have to look at Airbnb and you can look at the banking sector. You can look at the automotive se sector today where, you know, the, the trends tell us that, you know, in the future we might not buy a car, we might just rent a car on demand. Uh, the way we rent property, the way we do our banking, everything is changing and that's relentless. Um, and, and of course, you know, the expectation there is that design helps um, keep up with those trends and, and have a view on that. And, and be able to, to de design for, for, for these things. The obsessive customer centricity, the expectation of the customer is big. Um, it, it's ever demanding. And what we see is, uh, you know, just, just as a side note, a lot of companies don't pay, in, pay enough attention to their end-to-end -end experiences. If I give a personal anecdote, if if I, I I'm a, a customer with with Barclays Bank, they've invested a lot of money in their app, in 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 their interfaces. You can see it; it works better. The functionality is great. The minute you have a problem and you have to call their customer service, you just want to kill yourself because it's so bad. So there you have a break in the experience. You you you've got brand damage setting in because you you know I I've had a negative experience by just calling their um customer service. You can see from when you call their customer service that their systems are not joined up, that they don't have all the information about me as a customer. So so the so the the, the whole experience begins to feel a little bit disjointed. And customers are demanding that these experiences are cohesive and things just work. So this again uh, puts pressure on design to come up with uh, elegant solutions to 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 solve these from an experience perspective. And then, of course, the, the key one, the speed of delivery. And this, of course, this is where EPAM excels. It's, it's helped. We've helped a lot of our customers uh, um, across the across the globe. Um, we are we I, I would say proudly that we are able to deliver at speed. Um, we have some great integrated processes from a, from an agile perspective, bringing dis different disciplines together. But speed of delivery is key uh, in, in, in today's world and today's markets. 
So as I, as I mentioned, disruption has become a way of life and, you know, 63% of companies are experiencing disruption and 44% are highly vulnerable to future disruption. So it's ever present. That threat is always there. So it's important that companies have their act together in terms of understanding their customers and understanding the trends and, and the, 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 the direction of travel in their in their industry. And not all companies do this. I'm, I'm reminded of, of uh, Blockbuster. If anyone remembers the Blockbuster video service, they didn't believe in the in the digital world. And within two years, they, they got hammered by um, Netflix. And we know where Blockbuster is today. It's gone. And we, of course, Netflix is an um, extremely uh, successful company. Um, you can also use the example of Kodak. Um, Kodak didn't really invest or understand, um, uh, didn't uh, foresee the digital camera and the digitization of photography. It stuck its head in the sand and really thought that its, its film business would go on forever. And of course it didn't. Uh, and it filed for bankruptcy back in 2012, whenever it was. Company still exists today, but it's a fraction of the size that it, that it was. Same with uh, Nokia, who would have thought when in 2007, when the iPhone launched, that Nokia would be gone as a company within four years. It happened. And another really important fact is great product is extremely hard. And um, depending on the source of industry and the methods of measurement, product failure rates are high. And by product failure, I mean those that will turn a profit or meet the KPIs or expectations that were set for those products at, at, at launch. Um, and, you know, because great product is hard, you know, a lot of companies use EPAM uh, that keeps us in business, but that is the reality to, 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 to deliver a great and successful product is, is, is difficult. Jay. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so just just one again to talk about ourselves for a moment, uh, because it, it's a, I think it's a it's a great example of overall why this is important. We're we've seen a massive amount of growth uh, within this company. Again, it's doubled in size um, just in the last five years. Continuous growth all the time. A lot of that has been in investments in design. Uh, so I think we looked at that uh, that timeline earlier just to kind of show how that's grown. A lot of that's happened just in the past like six to eight years. So. Um, things are becoming really complex. Um, we have already put in the design ups in place, um, but it's certainly an evolving science and, it, and it's uh, continuing to grow. I'm going to continue on. Andy. Sorry, I was just looking at the questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, daily challenges. I think we've talked a lot about these already, so I don't want to spend too much time on these slides. But uh, again, you're just starting to see some of the stuff that tends to happen with scale, large diverse teams, uh, undefined uh, processes, standards, trouble coordinating, um, visibility across different parts of an organization, uh, things like knowledge management uh, and where people find things and how they are be become aware of things that are happening, stuff like that. These are all big, big problems that, that we face and that, uh, that a lot of large design organizations are facing now. Next one. Yeah, and, and we see these similars across a lot of industries and across a lot of uh, clients as well. So if, if, if you're a designer in an organization that's you know providing that as a service that, you know, not in-house, but on the agency side, um, you probably recognize a lot of these things with the clients that you work with. Um, so if they have internal designers that you may be working with, kind of seeing those things grow and then how you collaborate with them. Uh, as, as different product and service companies grow, some of the digital products and tools that they uh, create um, become very complex and the ecosystem becomes a little bit uh, fragmented uh, and disjointed and, and there may be lots of design debt uh, involved um, in, in keeping up with that and making sure that it's all consistent, things like that. So this this creates obviously inefficiencies downstream for development, uh, lots of code redundancy, all that kind of stuff. So it, it just becomes a cost issue for everybody. If you go to the next one, and I think that these, it's important to note that these are challenges that um, design consultants can can uh, solve on, on behalf of their clients. So this isn't just a, a problem internally for design organizations like like ours, for example. Um, you know, this is also something that um, uh, you know uh, can be an expert uh, consultative service as well that, that can be offered. So. 
uh, moving on. Yeah, and I, I, I think this is a, a great book to recommend if you haven't read it already on the topic, but to, uh, Org Design for Design Orgs, and, and Kristen Skinner mentions, uh, to realize team longevity and continue broadening impact, you must treat operations as seriously as the work products. And, and this is where it really, really breaks down, is I think, um, you know, design organizations are obviously really focused on delivering good design, and they try to, there are always um, uh, efficiencies and things that can be gained on that side, and that's, of course, part of design ups, but, but really understanding, um, uh, on the organization side, how uh, you're, you're enabling designers to do the best work and to be creative and do the things that they were hired for in the first place is really what what it's all about. And if you don't put that uh, that emphasis in, you won't get it back. Yeah, and I, I'd like to jump in there and reiterate a point I made earlier is that I think design has had and still does, uh, in my observation of companies that we work with, have a sustainability channel uh, challenge um, within within large organizations. Um, if a design group, for example, just sets up to design and make things pretty, it'll be out of business very quickly because there'll always be a cheaper alternative. Um, I think design has to have a strategic uh, focus as well. Um, and it needs design ops to drive that strategic focus, to drive its competency through the organization, to negotiate for budgets, to negotiate for its place at the, at the, at, at the table. Um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think design can ever take that for granted. Um, uh, and, you know, it, that's why, you know, we, we, we feel this, 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 this um, quote here is, is really pertinent. Um, we we really have to take operations has to be taken as serious as 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 work products. Yep. Uh, yeah. So so how do we how do we get all this done? You know, we've talked a lot about about challenges and and uh, and things that kind of need to be done. Um, how do you go about doing it? So um, building culture through design ops. Uh, what you can kind of see here to the right is how a design team often evolves. You know, sometimes it happens as small as a single person who then uh, you know hires a small team around them, and suddenly they basically are the design ops uh, uh, kind of leader. Um, as things start to grow over time, you probably need more specialized roles in in areas like um, design management or design operations, and you see that happen in, in larger organizations. So that's really what we're trying to put together. Um, but the point here again is that. I think oftentimes when you start talking about this stuff, designers become a little bit worried because they got into this industry and and uh, and you know honed their craft um, for for a reason. You know they want they want to design and create things, right? And they don't want to become bogged, bogged down by organizational um, uh, challenges and headaches and things like that. And and again, the whole point of this that that we see it as is, is is a way to free up those designers to do the things that they do best. So certain people are better suited for that, and and it's great to kind of um, start to create that specialization of a role. And that's that's really where this. Uh, I think, um, you know, works best. Um, do you want to go on to the next one? So so what we've done is uh, really broken this down as we see it in these five uh, different dimensions, um, more specifically. Um, in order to get this whole process going for ourselves, what we did was, was we really looked at some of these questions on the left. What is everybody actually doing? What are they working on? What are the biggest success stories across these different design organizations around, uh, you know, or the design groups around our organization? Um, you know what, what is, what's working well for them and, and, and what's not in terms of process and and, uh, and workflows and what can be learned from that or or on the flip side what are the bottlenecks um, and how do they measure all that uh, you know if, if things are more efficient how do we know uh, th those types of questions and, and so we're we're actually kind of digging in across the organization and trying to answer some of those things by talking to the different leaders around around the organization um, but in terms of how we organize uh, the output and the insights that we get from those conversations and 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 those plant that all that planning um it's broken down by these different dimensions and if you go to the next one andy we can uh, i think look at how those what, what kind of falls underneath them so in terms of when we talk about process we're talking about things like workflow um principles design definitions uh if there's a design language involved uh, both uh, internally and also at the project level for for different clients things like that tools obviously a design system is a hot topic when it comes to to uh, design ops but they're also um Different things like I think Freed will be will be talking on a, on a talk later today. Um, uh, lots of different sort of um, smaller things like scripts, uh, automation processes, different things like that that can be plugged into tools or how two different tools work together and efficiencies that we can we can set up between them. Things like that are, are really important. Uh, in terms of people, again, this is this is not something that's new to us or, or to any organization. Lots of uh, or any any I think successful design organization is thinking about. Uh, ways of recognizing and rewarding people, developing career paths and things like that. But really the key is we make sure that that's consistent across all the locations because uh, it's very easy when you look glo globally for that stuff to start to move in different directions. Uh, so kind of keeping keeping tabs on that, making sure it's all together. Um, 
And then on the organization side, I'd say the same goes there in terms of uh, how, how teams are structured and, and, and how that uh, um, enables the culture to be more uh, easily shared, I think, uh, across all. And then to make all this work, you really need some um, uh, sponsorship from senior leadership. So, so really um, pulling them in uh, across the entire um, process of this, making sure that they're aware of everything that we're doing uh, and support it and, and are kind of um, helping to make sure that, that uh, the team that's, that's putting this stuff together has everything they need to do it. Go to the next one. I don't want to go into this again. It's very tiny. You probably can't read it anyway. But what I wanted to show here is that one of the ways that you do this, how do you start to assess these things? If you take those dimensions and look at them across a maturity model, uh, this is something that our, our design ops team has put together uh, to, to evaluate both internally for ourselves um, and then also, also on behalf of our clients as a, a tool for consultation. So um, to really understand across each one of those dimensions, how you can sort of level up um, as you go. And, and if you can put something like this together, I think it really helps ground the conversations that you have and, and understand uh, you know, where you are and where you need to go. Um, and the next one. <laughs> And we've talked a lot about measurement and understanding whether or not it's actually working. Um, these are some suggestive areas I would say that, that can be looked at and can be actually turned into things like success metrics and, and, and uh, KPIs. So it's more, it's, it's sort of a fluid um, uh, left to right thing that you can read this as, but, but more toward the left are the things that you probably find in the near term when you're starting to set this stuff up. Um, you know, so how do you measure the, the product quality? Uh, how do you measure design debt? Things like that. Those, those are things that can be done, um, I, I think, pretty quickly, almost from day one, as soon as you start to get a sense of, of uh, where you're failing based on, on uh, assessment from a maturity model. Uh, um, <clears throat> and then things over to the right are more, um, they, they take a more mature and, uh, and the holistic view across the entire organization to really say that we have design ups figured out, at least in a, a working sense, um, to start to, to understand things like team growth, um, and market recognition. Uh, and so, so you can kind of see this um, evolving over time as a design ops practice grows with an organization. And these are some of the things that we're looking at. Um, and if you go to the next one. Yeah, so we wanted to make sure that we leave enough time for, for discussion here. So just the last thing is to show how you can help. And I've got one slide here. Yeah. Um, we've put together kind of a roadmap for ourselves and I wanted to share this is this is how we see this working and we've broken it apart into these different milestones. So for us, it, again, I, I showed some of these things already, the dimensions, facets, um, you know, how we kind of set this up as a framework, uh, how we see the uh, maturity model working, uh, what we see as success metrics, those kind of things. That's that's what we've kind of started with as a, as a, a you know, a way to benchmark the whole thing. Um, and then we see each one of these kind of building upon that. So if we can understand all that, we can start to learn a little bit more. We can make those things a little bit more detailed. Um, you know, we can we can just kind of take that a step further, kind of in what we're calling milestone two. Um, then for us, it, it really evolves into a practice uh, um, at that point where we can we can turn these things into stuff that can be circulated um, mm. you know, more globally, that kind of thing. And then as you kind of again look across these milestones, as as the organization grows and and becomes more mature, we see that as being something that then plugs into uh, an organization like ours, uh, the larger services that we offer, for example, a digital factory. Um, ultimately into something like a competency center and and then something that really we can build a, a community upon, which we're, we're already starting to do with, with um, discussions like this today. Um, but that's something that will really begin to take shape more, um, you know, as this whole thing matures. And so what can you do within your own organization? I think really decide what it means to you and your organization, because everything we've shown today here is, is um, you know, the definitions of it and, and, the, and the pieces of it that make sense for us based on what we understand about our own organization. Um, but that's going to be different for everybody, again, based on the size and the, the different different complexities. Um, enabling teams to constantly experiment with emerging tools and processes. I think it's really easy for design teams to just get stuck in the stuff that they do all the time because they know that that's it's tried and true and they know they know it's going to get the job done. Um, but if you don't do that, uh, or, you know, if you don't get out and find ways to experiment, you're never going to understand what's what's going to change. And I think Andy showed a slide earlier that looked at just in the past five years, how many new tools have come out. Um, you know, this is going to continue to explode and it's, it's a really sort of fragmented space and there's sort of a war about uh, about tools and processes right now across all these different um, uh, groups that are that are that are, that are thinking these up. I think, uh, you know, an example of a good way to do that is, you know, maybe you don't want to do that on a client's dollar, but can you do that, um, for example, in internal projects or, or processes like we're actually using uh, certain tools like Figma to um, explore some of the research that we're doing in design ops. So we're kind of using that as the tool to help collect a lot of those things. That's a great way to do it, right? Because there's really no pressure if, it, if, if a certain tool isn't work, is, or is or is not working, right? Uh, you, can, you can kind of pivot. Um, and again, understanding your role as a design team within a larger organization. Andy talked a lot about the business value of design and how that's changing. It's really important to understand that and to, and to really um, look at the ways that 
as a design group, you're going to bring value to the company and you're going to find ways to create savings and all that kind of stuff, right? That's that's all really, really important stuff that's going to elevate design in the eyes of the, of the larger organization that, that you exist within. Um, and then again, contribute, contributing to a community. So a lot of what we've found in our research has also been externally at different experts around, around the organization. Uh, we wouldn't have gotten where we were so far uh you know without those people sharing that stuff um and so i think it's, it's just really important to see everybody get out there and, and start to share this stuff as much as possible um so that's uh yeah i i, I just, just just to add to that i i think what we're seeing as well is there's a lot of pockets of activity going on especially across epam and um, really and some very good stuff and we just want to try and pull all that together now uh, and, and begin to really get this into a more uh, cohesive uh, 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 group of activities so that we can really begin to to build um, our, our our competency in this area and um, to to um, also to bring all the benefits of what we've discussed uh, about um, the, 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 the design ops today. Thank you. So thank you. I think, uh, and if you go to the next slide, I think we're yeah, you've opened mic, guys. So you, let's get those questions in and, and have a have a discussion. OK, uh, so we have a few questions and then what's happened before is as this happens, more questions come in. So we'll just start with the first one in, which was um, what are some common myths about design ops? Uh, myth busters. Yeah, OK, that, that's a very good question. I would say the first one is that we don't need it and um, that's a myth. Uh, we absolutely do. Um, but the other one that that springs to mind for me is it's not just about design systems and um, uh, component libraries. It's a lot broader. It's a lot. It's a lot more involved. It's really taking um, design um, as a competency um, uh, into into a different level of maturity and providing the tools and the processes for it to be um, effective and quality driven within large organizations. I don't know if you'd want to add to that. Um, uh, I think those are, those are great ones. Those are some of the first I thought of. The one, one thing I would add is we talked about this a little bit in the talk, but um, this this sort of impression that if you embrace this way of thinking that you're going to become less creative or that your organization is going to become less creative. And I think the opposite is true. It's really by embracing this stuff, it, it enables designers to do uh, what they love because it, it really frees up their time. That's the sort of the main success metrics of, of this in the short term in my mind is is getting designers back to doing what they like to do, right? which is really solving creative problems. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That and sustaining design as a competency within within large or I know I've said this quite a few times today um, but a lot of large organizations uh, and I, I've seen this over the years have invested in design as a competency and then de-invested they've just taken the money out and said now ah, we don't need this and then they've gone gone back and done it again um, and that that indicates to me that design as a function um, is misunderstood uh, design as a function doesn't have its doesn't have its shit together to really get this uh, to 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 sustain itself within these um, organizations and design ops helps that but it also helps designers just get on and design yeah can i can i probe on that how does it help them get on and design right so if the myth is oh now there's all these processes i have to follow i have to do all this stuff like how is it actually freeing up design yeah yeah that's a great question so um I, I can give you like some small examples. Um, something we've done on a couple projects with with clients is look at the workflow that designers are going through, um, comparing that against other projects where certain things worked better or worse, right? And then um, freeing designers up from like uh, detailed processes that were agreed upon around like writing spec documents and stuff like that, right? Which was just a kind of a total waste of time for designers or something that they hated to do. And, th and there are ways to avoid that. Um, and, and then um, there are different like, processes that can be automated. Another one that comes to mind that I'm sure a lot of designers have faced in the past is like preparing assets to be passed off to developers. There are lots of evolving ways that that's that's becoming easier now, right? And and I wouldn't say that there's even one good solution to that yet. There are lots of different different options for it. And, and those are some of the things that we're evaluating, just seeing what's what's working the best. So it's, it's yeah. like that. Like I think designers just kind of 
they really like to work on the design, but then there's all this extra stuff that comes with designing like like that, like packaging everything up and handing it off. And it, it just becomes so many headaches, right? And those are the types of things that we're trying to identify and fix. Yeah, and I, I think another one, another good example is um, EPAM is an engineering company, right? So at its soul, it's engineering, that's fine, that's given. Um, but a lot of the project managers or delivery managers that we would work with are very much engineering focused. Um, and if I take an example of the acquisition of Think that we did uh, in, in London, they, they have um, very digitally focused uh, producers or project managers or delivery managers. And if you work with one of them as a designer, your life is a lot easier and less complicated. Um, often within organizations, design has to fight its own corner with clients, with customers, and, and basically on things that should be taken up and done somewhere else. And, and that's really what we're trying to do is take away all that complexity and all that noise so that the, the, the designers can, can you know, just keep their back free so they can do the, the work that they need to, to do. That, that's the idea okay. anyway. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the next question is a bit long. Let me see if I can make it shorter. So um, from Anonymous, so Anonymous, you're not going to win the prize since you didn't say who you were. If you want to send me your email, do it. Um, as most of us are living in the outsourcing world where people get hired only if the client understands the value of having design ops on his project, um, as it's still kind of an emerging practice, um, how can we involve get design ops people involved in our projects and who would pay for them? The client, uh, the organization, or uh, is it just something that should be booked into every project? Something. Yeah, that's a that's an awesome question. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's it's a little bit of each. So so one of the things I mentioned was that uh, maturity model, for example. One thing that we're trying to do is is evolve things like that into a larger assessment service that we can offer as like a design consultancy for clients because we, we, we kind of work with, with clients and they come in many different shapes and sizes, right? And, and sometimes we're sort of appended to an internal design team. Sometimes there is no internal design team and we're kind of doing it all ourselves. It's, it's all, you know, many, many different shapes and forms. Um, but the thing that we've found that that's really interesting is that oftentimes when we make observations based on our experience from working with lots of different types of design groups on other projects, uh, clients who work internally on, uh, in in-house teams um, maybe are sometimes less exposed to that stuff or maybe they're just too in the weeds with their own way of working and things like that. So there's a, there's a lot of value that we can bring I would say in the way that we can um, uh, develop a, kind of a rigorous assessment um, and an action plan and, and uh, consultancy services around design ops. I, I think that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that there is a, a certain degree of this that definitely has to happen ourselves internally and, and that's yeah. not something that we can go out and just charge clients for. Like we need to have our own house in order in order to sell our own services to do design work in the first place. That's something that, that I, I think um, every large organization just needs to recognize that dedicated roles probably need to be um, put in place to manage some of this stuff when the scale becomes so big in a design team that that maybe the the head of design or whatever can't manage it on their own, um, you know, which is I think very common in design organizations of uh, the scale of the ones that, that we kind of mentioned today. Um, and then lastly, we have found um, specific projects around areas of improvement that we that we may offer. Um, that uh, that can be built right into the early discussions with the client. So we may have a, a project where um, we're building some new um, digital product uh, that falls within a larger ecosystem and the client through discussions with us has already acknowledged that there's some fragmentation across that and we can probably use that project as a way as kind of a launch pad to unify all of them together through things like a design system or whatever. Um, those are the types of things that I would say we would actually sell into a, a project itself if that, if that makes sense. So it's kind of those three dimensions would be my view, but Andy, I don't know if you. Yeah, I, I think you, 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 you've you covered the three quite well. Um, I would say two key things for me. One is, yes, we have to have our own house in order uh, from a design operations perspective. And that's something, you know, that's that we're aware of and that we're that that's beginning to happen. The second, though, and, and it's more interesting, and I think your question is quite good there because it's opened this up is how do you package up design ops as a proposition to sell to customers? And um, will we call it design ops? Not sure. Um, you might go in and say, like we know, for example, a lot of large companies we work with don't have, have uh, or they might just have rudimentary um, pattern libraries. So, you know, we could, 
we you know we could build a proposition around that and be able to uh, offer that to our clients um as uh, as as a way to to introduce the um the design ops so i think there is a bit of work to be done around selling it as an entity and um, what we will call it and how we will break it up is 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 is, is ongoing but i think it's clear what we need to do internally to to make things work work better. Um, okay. Yeah, from design ops. Yeah. All right. I think we might have time to squeeze in one more question. I'm not sure if you you guys can see the last three. I don't know which one you could answer in two minutes. <laughs> one oh, is sharing experience about building a designer research phase. How would you rate our own level of design maturity? <laughs> Opportunities as an organization. That's from an epammer. And where's the line between good and fast delivery and Let's unnecessary control? Um, Which one could you answer the fastest? And yeah, I'll let you. OK, I, we, we try and go through all three really quick. So experience Ooh, building okay. a design or research knowledge base. Yeah, when I was at Deutsche Telekom, we, we built a, a, a knowledge base. Um, it was connected to um, our pattern library. Um, and we actually had a dedicated team um, that would um, gather um, research across the Deutsche Telekom group and and um, um, basically act as librarians to pull it together and to to disseminate it across the different teams. Um, but like any of these things, they're only as good as the people uh, that use it. You know what I mean? Like we we can first of all, we have to kind of find the technology that will that will um, that that will that, that we can store this to these uh, repositories on and then we have to use it. Um, and I, this is one, this is one thing I've always found with designers. They're not they're not the most disciplined, so there has to be a bit of discipline there if we want to make these things successful. But it's, it's a really good question. Um, the second Should one. Should I exert some discipline now and say that's it? You don't have time for any more questions. Do we not? No. Uh, I've been told we have three minutes. I need to have a we need to have a print a winner. So you can choose one of the. Um, one of the questions as the best question. And if your question is chosen, so while they're looking, um, you can just ping me your email address into the Q&A and I will not publish it. So your email address won't go live to anyone. So if you just, uh, I've been asked to get the winner's email. I'll, I'll just say, by the way, for the last two questions, if you, you guys want, you can contact me and Andy on the side. We can answer those as well. I, I Kat, I, I know you, so you feel free to reach out to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just for a little fun, uh, a whopping nine people who are watching this have used a 56k modem. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, no, that, makes the age. Feel, that makes me feel really good, guys, because I thought I might be the oldest here. So that's really good. I'm really happy. And 14k is where I started, but anyway, you know, 56k <laughs> was like that was just. I remember I got my 56k modem. I was, I still have it actually. I was so, uh, so excited. Um, Any yeah. Favorite, so, favorite question. My, mine yeah. was actually the anonymous one. Um, to be honest, I, I don't know who that was. <laughs> but uh, let's see if I could vote outside of that. Um, I'm gonna. I I I would vote um, Bessie, which I know we didn't get to answer that question, <laughs> but I think it's a really good one. I, I do. Yeah, that. I'd love to. I'd love to spend some time discussing that. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant question. OK, so is that uh, both of you like Vesely's question? Yes. OK, Vesely, so can you, you please holiday, ping your you just email? Want a holiday to San Francisco for two weeks, all expenses paid by ARC. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> or a one year balsamic description. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, this has yeah. been a lot of fun. Uh, the next session I think is going to start in another five or ten minutes um, and then it's going to be moderated by my colleague Emily. So thank you so yeah. much everyone. Enjoy yeah, the rest no of Design Z day. Yeah, Thanks. thank you guys. Yep, Bye. reach out if you have any questions. Bye. 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 Bye.